Hey guys, today is Saturday, March 12th, 2016. Um, I am coming to you with another podcast answering your questions. Um, Super excited about this podcast today. If you've listened to all, however many, I think maybe it's 80, hopefully podcast. I started podcasting back in 2011 and it's something that people on Twitter asked me to do um, based on my tweets like, oh my God, we want more. Can you... Um, extend your tweets in a podcast. So I would podcast uh, with, let's just say, maybe 30 people listening to each one, if that. Sometimes only just 11. Um, And I didn't know much about podcasts. And now that everybody and their mother podcasts, um, my college roommate sent me this, uh, well, she didn't send it to me. She gave me this microphone that I'm using today. So for the first time ever, Um, this is a podcast with better sound quality. I have always just used my laptop to record these because I can record anywhere. I was able to pack my microphone today and I am recording from my hotel room in Chicago. Um, so I have a lot of really good questions today. I am having some coffee this morning. Uh, I will go through the housekeeping and all that good stuff, but I think you guys are going to be excited about this podcast because there's a lot of um, good questions in the first question that you guys sent me. Um, it was just so good. So if you have questions that you want to ask me that are beyond uh, sort of like, where do I get this? Where do I get that? Most of the time, if you just uh, Google some of the keywords of the things that you see me post, I promise you can find it because I do like 85% of my shopping online. Um, but hold on just one second because I'm taking a sip of coffee. Uh, and I'm drinking my coffee black because I'm trying to drop just a couple pounds before a girl's trip to Jamaica. Eh. Anyway, housekeeping is as such. My com is the website. Um, journals are on sale there. Uh, the first journal, which I love that teaches you my journaling process, as well as the this is my year journal in which I share with you um, sort of how I go about assessing my year. I love both of the journals for no other reason than these are the actual journals that I use to stay organized professionally. I have used this brand of journals for at least I would say six or so, maybe even seven years. Um, I just I like the paper quality. I like that if I start something, I can just rip out the pages. Um, And I like that regardless of the pen that you use or however you highlight that the paper is thick enough that it doesn't necessarily bleed through. So without further ado, I am going to get into today's podcast. First question is from Portia. Hi, Portia. And thank you for sending me this awesome question. Hey, my lake. What do you feel is the biggest hurdle African-American young professional women will have to overcome in the next two years? She follows up with another question. Um, What qualities do you seek when you are building your team professionally and personally? Thank you. Um, Currently developing my girl squad of dynamic friends in my life. Um, Sorry about that. I don't know what that is. I'm on my computer, but I think Facebook uh, makes that noise. All right, let me get into my answers. Um, It took me a little bit to think about this because I was like, wow, this is such a good slash deep question. Um, I mean, I would consider myself a young professional African-American woman. Um, But when you ask me, I think about women who are younger than me. For those of you that don't know, I'm 36. So I think about women who may be a decade younger than me. Let's say the 26-year-olds. Um and even a little bit younger recent college grads, girls who are entering the workforce. And I just said, like, if I had to think of one thing to tell you, and there are tons which I have podcasted about, the one thing that I think is going to be a big hurdle for um, young professional women is the understanding that all good things take time. Um, I know you guys uh, have heard the term microwave society, but I feel like you more than anyone. And when I say you, I mean, young professionals, millennials, 20 somethings, you more than anyone, um, are in the midst of this microwave society where everything is done so quickly from, I mean, you can get around quicker with Uber. Uh, I remember it just used to be so much harder to get things done and the time that it took to get these things done without like, so many resources taught you a lot of things, you know? So it's like 
you really had to plan for things if you were going out of town. Like if you were going to be traveling, you had to have your confirmation number, your itinerary, your ticket. You had to have all your stuff printed out. Today, it's like as long as you got the apps, as long as your phone is charged, you're pretty much set up. And I think that the millennials are going to just have to understand that um, you're going to have to be patient and allow for some allow for time to teach you things and time tends to teach you things in ways that make you uncomfortable so if you don't like your job or you are you know in a complex situation with um someone you may be dating or maybe dating is difficult for you or whatever it is um you're going to have to allow time to help you work those things out and so I think that you can go to every class and every seminar and every meetup, um, but the real world is how you're going to learn. And so I think that you should be insanely appreciative that you can do things a lot faster, but I think that you should also just honor the universe and honor time and give yourself room and space to grow and blossom um, slowly, if you will. Like, you know, it, things take time. And so if something doesn't work out right away, give yourself time to sort of decompress, you know, assess what went wrong and then try again. So that is what I think is going to be the big hurdle um, is figuring out how to the right balance of patience and um, patience and just being aggressive. So it'll be a tricky balance, but be patient. Uh, your next question was, what qualities am I seeking when building my team? I always look for heart and grit. Someone who may not have had the best circumstances, but is making the best of their life. So um, I appreciate a college degree, but it's not necessary. Um, I appreciate some level of experience in this space, but it's not necessary. Um, there are things that I can tell when I interview someone or just when I talk to someone that lets me know that they have heart. Um, next thing I look for is sophistication. Um, someone who knows how to move around in a manner that is professional and aware. Um, there's this level of just like professional, I guess, awareness and maturity that I look for someone who, you know, is sophisticated in their responses, sophisticated in how they interact. And this is not necessarily, oh, you know, high brow or anything like that, but just kind of just like some very basic things. Um, what else am I looking for? I'm looking for someone who is available to learn. Um, nothing grates my nerves more than someone who wants to pretend that they know everything because nobody knows everything and you shouldn't want to know everything. And so you should always be available to learn and um, always project that. Like I know these things, but um, I'm, I'm curious about these things. So I'm looking for curiosity, but I'm also looking for confidence, um, confidence in what you already know. Uh, and then I just look for excellence. I look for people who do things very well all the time. So those are the things that I'm looking for, um, when building a team. So I didn't know if you were using that to build a professional team because you said you were building up a girl squad of dynamic friends. Um, and I think the next question is going to help with the friend question. Um, and it seems like a lot of women uh, who are younger or older are um, are concerned with, you know, friendship. So that's my next question. My leak. What's your advice for maintaining friendship with women? I feel like I'm at a place where I want to have healthy, non-toxic friendships with women. Uh, okay. Um, drinking this black coffee, girl. Uh, first thought I had is, what kind of friend are you? So, if you want healthy, non-toxic friendships, then you definitely cannot be a unhealthy, toxic friend. Um, I'm not going to say that you sort of, you are what you attract, but in some ways you are. And that was a truth that I had to learn about myself, um, that I was essentially responsible for the things, the people, the relationships that I invited into my life. And I had this crazy epiphany 
a couple years ago, it might be two by now, where I was kind of borderline with a friend, you know, like I like them, but there was something about the person that concerned me. But I chose to overlook it because I was just like, well, they have these other qualities or they can relate to me in a way that some other people can't. But it was just like the one thing that turned me off was the way that they treated people that they felt were, quote unquote, beneath them. And I'm just not that kind of person. And, you know, eventually it all came down that like if you know, I have this really super silly and definitely makes no sense analogy where I say, if you flip, you'll flop, meaning if they'll treat, you know, if you how you treat a a homeless person is how you'll treat the highest person, you know. And so I'm like, if she can treat these people that way, at some point, she's going to treat me that way. And so um, I just had to learn to do a better job um, of choosing people and, and making better choices came from understanding who I am, valuing myself and not allowing someone to be in my life and be a friend because they can take a trip, you know, at the last minute. Cause that, you know, Oh, well, if I want to go to Miami, this person can go to Miami tomorrow. You know, it's like, Oh, so that makes us friends. Not exactly. Uh, so that was a long winded. What kind of friend are you? Um, The next thing is in order to have friends, you have to be a friend. That means showing up at their events and their priority engagements. Um, I used to struggle with that back in the day because I was like, oh, my God, I have so much to do all the time. But I figured out a way to um, make sure that whenever possible, I showed up at my friends things. And even if that meant that I couldn't stay, I would do something like, hey, girl, um, I know that your big whatever, let's, you know, your big show or whatever is tonight. It is the same night of, you know, this big meeting or this big I have to travel. But can I come early and help you set up? You know, it's like that's how you can support a friend and be there when you can't necessarily be there. Or, you know, sometimes if I can't be there physically, it's like, can I connect you with someone that's going to help your event go easier or can I help out um, in another way can I order the invitations can I send the invitations Um, can I help you maintain the RSVP list Um, there are so many things that you can do to help your friends with their events and their priority engagements whether you can kind of be there or not Um, I also send my friends cards um, when I can't be there so you know I think about them and I just want to let them know that I'm thinking of them um you have to check in and on your friends when you don't need anything you know it's like and that goes for professional relationships too if the only time you're reaching out to somebody is when you need them to pick you up or when you need them to do something for you that's not really being a friend um And so, you know, it also means getting together with them for things that matter. And so I have a really good friend who um, had a recent birthday and she had like a host of parties and I could not make it to any of the parties uh, because of my schedule. But uh, I picked up a gift for her. I would say maybe I picked up a gift and I invited her out to lunch the Saturday um, of her birthday week. So let's just say it was on a Wednesday. That Saturday, I was like, hey, if you're available for lunch this afternoon, you know, on the Saturday afternoon, I'd love to get together with you, treated her to lunch, had a cute little gift for her. Um, because sometimes you can't be at everything, but you can still let them know that you care. Um, I also think being a good friend means, you know, upholding the loyalty and upholding the loyalty is just not intercom, not entertaining conversations about them when they are not around. Um, when you don't allow people to talk about your friends to you, it really says even more about you as a person. And if you don't give people the platform to talk trash about your friends, they'll know that they can't do that. And um, it becomes something where it doesn't even happen. You know, it's like, I just, that's just something that if that's my friend, like we just, we just don't do that. Or um, if we are discussing, because people do talk about their friends, like, let's just be honest. You have to make sure that you've had the conversation with your friend first. You know what I mean? And anything that you're saying is not malicious or anything like that, but you're just like, 
I already said this to that person and maybe you have another conversation because you want someone else to kind of help out, help your friend get to the next level. Um, you also need to be a listening ear. Um, when they need it. And you also need to hold them accountable. So if your friend tells you that they're going to be doing something, my friend's like, you know, I'm going to start applying for jobs in this space because I need to make more money. Then you need to be like, what's up with the job search? How's that going? Um, Who have you heard from? What are you doing? So I think that those are the ways that you have healthy friendships. They're not toxic if you don't allow them to be. And basically, if you just cut the drama, cut the drama, meaning don't even allow um, your friendships to be the space for drama and BS, they won't be toxic at all. Um, next question. Next question. Uh, hi, my leak. I have two questions. I feel like a lot of these questions have been double questions, but that's okay. Um, how do you feel about fans coming up to you during vacations or personal time? And second, I was in a horrible situation ship. I ended it, but feel horrible. I know I deserve better. But I think I got so used to being treated like crap. Any tips? Thanks for what you do. Ah, uh, oh boy. Um, let's see. As far as people coming up to me uh, during vacations and personal time, I don't mind it. It always is so surprising to me because it still blows my mind that people actually even care um, about me in that way. So um, I'm always surprised and thankful. Uh that people do care um I was just in Trader Joe's a couple of weeks ago and if you're listening hey girl I was in Trader Joe's and um I was in line and a young lady came up to me and was just like my leak I'm I love what you do do you mind if I take a picture and I was just glad I had on makeup that day because um for the most part I don't get dressed up and I don't really do my makeup when I am at home or even on vacation. So um, that more than anything is the thing that I'm like, oh, God, I look horrible. Um, I just because of the travel and, you know, the things that I have to do where I sort of have to be made up, I really enjoy kind of just doing nothing. Um, So I don't mind. Uh, As far as the situation ship, um, I wrote some notes. So let's just see. It says, I ended it. Here are my, here are my notes. You said I ended it, but I feel horrible. Um, and my first thought was like, regardless of the status of the relationship, regardless of what kind of relationship this is, um, being involved with anyone deeply, um, intimately is an exchange of feelings, is an exchange of energy and endings can still hurt even if they are on our terms, you know? And so, I ended my last relationship and it wasn't a situation ship. It was like um, a relationship in which it was a committed relationship um, with someone who wanted to be with me. And um, I wasn't sure if I wanted to be with that person, you know, and it was like, I felt like I wasn't sure, but the only way to find the only way to become sure was to continue to date that person. And so it's kind of messed up because It's like you have to, it's the act of doing in order to find out which has the chance of hurting the other person. Um, But how else will I know? And so after several months, several, several months, I was just like, this is not for me. Um, And it wasn't, that person wasn't a bad person. It was just like, I, there's some sort, there's a, there are a handful of feelings that I want to have in a committed relationship that I didn't have. Um, And I don't think it was about that person. It it was just like, well, I guess it was, it's like that person didn't evoke those emotions in me. So I ended it and I still was slightly bummed, you know? So even though the ending was technically on my terms, I still felt bad, you know? So horrible feelings are normal. Um, the other thing that I have is that you you just you don't get what you don't ask for. So when I say that, I'm saying that you're only going to have the kind of relationships that you tolerate until you start being upfront about what you want. Um, you don't have to agree to be in a situationship if that's not what you want. Um, and I know all of this seems like insane, insanely common sense, but I too have been in a plethora of situationships. You know, I'm listen, honey, I am not above a situationship. Um, but 
I think that I ended up in situationships because I really thought I liked this person and I felt so attracted and there was all this chemistry and whatever, but the person wasn't, their actions weren't in line with either what they were saying or, or I, I just hoped that they would get to a point that they felt the way that I felt about them. And, uh, you know, you, you have to stop making excuses for other people's behavior. If they don't call you back when they say they are, you need to be done. Um, if they don't do the things that they say they're going to do, you need to be done. If they stand you up, you need to be done because with all of the technology that we have today, hello, new podcast microphone, um, Someone can call you back without even dialing your number, knowing your number or whatever else. And so there are so many ways to reach a person. Um, I literally locked, this is an old school story, but I literally locked myself uh, out of the house with my phone inside and was able to go to the neighbor's house, get on my iCloud, pull up my contacts, use her phone call someone who had a key to come let me in. Like anybody that wants to do something today can do it. And so if they're not doing it, they don't want to. Um, So I think that it is very mature and very adult to say what you want in the beginning, in the beginning. And so what does that mean? What, what do you say? That is, I am dating in hopes of having a committed relationship. So that is not being like, I want to walk down the aisle in two weeks or two months or two years. Um, I think that that's just the first line I'm dating. And hopefully you are dating, uh, meaning that you are sort of um, seeking and weighing, seeking and weighing options in hopes of having a committed relationship. And then I think over time, as you are dating, when the questions come up, like, you know, would you like to be married? Like, I remember asking um, the person that I'm currently with who has been divorced, like, would would you want to be married again? And just asking the question because I want to know because there's no need in me sitting up looking stupid, uh, being with someone for a long time. And, you know, they... I'm doing this because they didn't ask the question. Now, quick little break. I do hear like housekeeping outside. I don't have my um, don't disturb thing on here. So if I just break for a second to say not yet, please forgive me. Um, So I think that you have to do that. You have to say you have to ask the questions. You have to. I I mean, I'll tell you. I'm going to tell you about a situation ship in which I was. I don't even know what you call situating with someone for months and didn't even know that they had children. Like, how did that happen? I never asked. Like, I don't know why I didn't ask. Maybe I just wanted to assume they didn't, but that was kind of the deal. And I'm just like, oh my God, I can't believe I let that happen. So there is a saying that um, one dates at the level of their self-esteem. And in many ways, I believe that to be true. Hold on one second. I'm going to put this privacy, please, thing on my door. Ah! All right. So that I don't get interrupted. Um, uh, So back to that. There's a saying that one dates at the level of their self-esteem. And so I just took, I just have these quick Uh, notes that I found online um, and I'll just enhance them with my own feelings but we'll do this just for you because I want you to do better and be better is that steps to improve your self-esteem positive self-talk you have got to be positive with yourself I do not like it when people you know are constantly judging themselves you know what I mean it's just like even online it bums me out when people are like I let, you know, my hair is this, my this is that. It's just like, you got to stay positive all the time about yourself. Be like, girl, I look good. <laughs> I look good today. And if you can't find something, be like, my nails look good, okay? My neck looks good. Something looks good. Another important thing is do not compare yourself to others. Um, I know it's hard to do, but don't do it. Like, I posted a picture of my boo. Oh, my God. Hi, boo. On my Instagram, and people are like, relationship goals. And I'm just like, ah. I hate that because I'm just like, um, everybody, 
will get to a place at their own time and everything may not be for you. It's just like, I found something that works for me. You know what I mean? Like, uh, finally. And, and, and who's to say how long that lasts? Because it's like, you just, you, you want it to last as long as it can. And that just is what it is. And so no big deal. Exercise, uh, super important. I'm actually going to exercise today. However you do it, it'll help you. I think they said it takes seven minutes for your endorphins to kick in. So don't quit until you reach the seven minute mark. Um, don't strive for perfection because it's not possible. Uh, none of us are perfect. We'll never be self-included. Um, don't beat yourself up when you make a mistake. We all make mistakes. I think some people are typically shocked when I am, you know, people expect for me to be upset or to fall out. And I'm just like, Hey, I made a mistake. Uh, focus on the things you can change. That's so important. If you know, like, if you know that there are things that you can do to enhance your life or to lose weight or whatever, focus on what you can change and the stuff that you can't, don't worry about it. Um, do things that you enjoy. I think people think that like, you know, I see that the struggle is real struggle. Don't have to be real girl. Do what you enjoy. Um, have a happy life and, um, celebrate the small stuff. All right. Next question. How do I tell my boss I'm bored at work? I want new responsibilities without him tripling my workload. I'm a writer slash editor in my 30s with a lot on my plate. I'm looking for a shift in duties to create space for new projects. Need key language to use so it doesn't sound like I'm saying unload more work on me. Okay, so this is what I got a lot to say about this because... And sister friend, I hope you, you take some notes and you may not, you may, you may snarl at first, but when I'm done, you're going to be like, you know what? She has a point. (laughs) So first I was like, you have to learn how to become more specific about what you want at work because saying you're bored at work and want new responsibilities is saying, give me new things to do in addition to the boring stuff I'm doing now. Um, newsflash newsflash number one your work won't always be interesting there's a lot of stuff that has to be done that simply isn't exciting or amazing ask me how I know so I think a lot of times we look around and we see people and it looks like oh my god every second of their life is amazing and I want that job because it looks so fun Every second of your work is not going to be exciting. Um, And then I had another news flash and it was like, have you mastered the boring stuff that you've been tasked to do? Are you killing it? Because that's usually how you get moved off or moved up is that you are just killing the tasks that are before you. And so then you get invited to do new dope things. Um, So that's a question I want you to ask yourself. And then I want to say that you have to learn to communicate. Um, And when you go talk to your boss, I want you to start with what you love. Starting with what you love disarms the person. You know what? Let's just call him Tim. You know what, Tim? I am just um, thrilled to be working at wherever the heck you work. And what I love most about being here is the camaraderie and this and that and how we stay a, ahead and we are constantly moving forward. And I love my team. You know, I'm making stuff up, but I'm just saying, I'm giving you stuff to say. Um, the next thing you want to do is follow up with very specific things you'd like to do. And if you really want a yes, show what you've already done um, that proves that you are ready for new projects. So I would say um, these are some of the things that I would love to start doing. And here are some examples of things that I've done. These are my ideas. Um, I think I don't, I mean, I'm not fully privy to how the world of media um, and writing works, but as a former PR person, I know a little. Um, And my thing is, I don't like it when people come to me telling me what they could do or should do or would do it's like show me what you've done and in order for you to show me what you've done you may have to do it after hours you know what I'm saying so if you if if tri- you, you're gonna have to triple your workload on your own so you may have to show me something when you're off and 
you also have to understand that these new projects may triple your workload. You know what I mean? So let's just say he takes you off the boring stuff and you get these new projects. There's a chance that your workload may be tripled. And so you need to under like, are you okay with that? Um, because you should be an extra work won't kill you. And so bring it on, bring on the triple workload, bring on what I want to be doing. Um, and sometimes you may still have to do the boring stuff and you still may find that even with your new projects, there's an element of boring stuff that just has to be done. Got it. Good. Next question. Um, this is a good one. Hi, I have been working at my company for three years. Recently, I have been promoted to a manager position. Two questions. Any advice to a new manager? And the second one is my super, my direct supervisor who I have been cool with is acting sour and negative about this change. How do I handle this without causing too much trouble? Um, and you left your name, but I'm not going to say your name just for your sake. Hey girl. Um, it is now, so congratulations to you. First of all, um, it is now your job to make sure that you have the skills to manage. So I, earlier this year, I promoted someone in my office to manager and, um, I recently sent her to a, um, new managers class. So there are plenty of them all over the United States. I paid for her class, but, Um, if this is really important to you and your career matters to you, you can ask for your company to send you to this class. And this class essentially equips new managers with how to handle situations, how to communicate. Um, and if your company won't pay for it, I say that you pay for it yourself because there are some classes that aren't the most expensive and there are even some like e-courses that I think that you should do. So I feel like it is now your responsibility to make sure that you know how to effectively manage. Um, there are a lot of really good articles on management, um, in Harvard business review and Harvard business review has tons and tons of these little like sort of, um, short books on different things that you may struggle with, different challenges. Um, And so I would say that you should look into that. Um, And as far as the negative supervisor, I mean, that's just kind of a way of life. Some people just take longer to adjust to new things. And, you know, maybe they didn't see you as a manager. And so that's shocking to them. I have had some people who have stopped being friends with me because they didn't see me to become as successful as I did. And when and when I did, um, they just couldn't handle it. And it's just like, I'm sorry, but you don't get to decide how far I can go in my life. Um, And another thing is that the person may now feel threatened that if you got promoted to manager, who's to say that you won't then have their job, you know, and those are normal and natural feelings, but, um, that is still not your problem. And so I think that, um, you just cannot worry about it. You still should just communicate like you have been. Um, and if you consider this person, so if you feel like this is somebody that you can have a legitimate conversation with, go to lunch and just go, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm making this up. Maybe this is all in my mind, but I feel like ever since I got promoted, like our relationship is different. And, you know, I, like I enjoyed our like work friendship and like, I really like interacting with you. And I think that together, I know that we can be a great team and continue to get promoted and whatever, but just kind of let them know that. I still want to be cool with you, you know, um, because I value, it's okay to value friendships and even work relationships. It's okay to do that. So have a conversation. Um, next question. I value your opinion. In fact, I hated my job so much. I just listened to your podcast to help me get through the day. Listening also helped me get motivated enough to launch my business. My question is, what can I do to break into the industry and service others through my craft full time? Um, so I got three really good points. Um, first point, if you hate your job, the next step may not necessarily be starting your own business. Um, just want to put that out there. Starting a business can come from loving your job, but still having this aching feeling of wanting something more, wanting to solve a problem, wanting to meet a need that you know you can fix. And so when you ask me how you can break into the industry, 
my answer to you is to apply for a job in the industry because that's going to allow you to learn how to do your business and your craft full time. Thank you for that. Um, and that's just like, I just want to say that because everybody's like, you know, I'm sick of working a nine to five. Those are a lot of the questions that I get and I don't want to help somebody else build up their dream. And it's like, why not? You know what I mean? Like I've helped lots of people build their dreams and I'm essentially helping people build their dreams by way of this podcast. So I just don't think that that's the right thing to say. Um, I have friends who are building companies and building dreams that, I want to support and I want to help. And so, you know, um, having being an entrepreneur doesn't mean that you don't have a job. It's like you do have a job. And what happened, what happened to me um, when I launched Curlbox is that my job became a nine to five because of the companies that I work with. I work with brands that are nine to five brands. So guess what time I have to be open Um, And I obviously work around the clock, um, but I am working before nine and I'm definitely working nine to five and after five o'clock. And so I have a nine to five plus. So there's nothing wrong with a nine to five. I just don't know why people keep saying that. It's like I get it, but it's about having a nine to five on your own terms, you know, and the way that you are able to have your own terms is working hard enough to you work for your freedom you work for people to trust you so much that they are not asking you to clock in and out and if you say hey next week I want to come in at 10 o'clock when you're a hard worker nobody's going to fight you on that all right next question and I think I have a couple more I'm answering a lot today um next question is how do you keep your hunger for business? I'm going into my ninth year of business and find myself not being as motivated and hungry as I was when I first started my law firm. What do you do to keep that hunger alive? And my answer is, I'm sorry about that. My answer is that my business isn't exactly separated from my life. Um, Yes, there are times when I, you know, when I stop working and I try to put that balance in there, but I am, I am doing exactly what I want to be doing. And so my question to you is, is this exactly what you want to be doing? Um, Are you tired of lawyering? And I asked that question because about seven years ago, I was in a relationship with an attorney and I remember just watching him wake up each morning and just really not being happy with what he was doing. And I think that his reasons for lawyering were, you know, um, status uh, were he it was a promise that he made to a parent that ended up dying, I think. And so it's like I felt like in many ways he was doing it for things or people other than himself. And I'm not saying that that's the case with you, but. I think it's just a real question and something to consider. And so I guess I would ask you, what else are you interested in? Is there a way that maybe you can enhance what you're doing or uh, take on another practice or go back to school and learn something else or create something innovative online? Um, And so I'm just wondering, are you interested in other things? Are you afraid to move on? And do you think the firm can operate without you or with less of you? Because um, after nine years, it may be time to split your time up and pursue other things. And so um, the way that I think that I keep my hunger is that once I've learned something in the business, uh, I have hired people to do those things so that I can move on to new challenges. So once I've mastered something, I hire someone that I think can do it. I teach it to them, allow them to master it and enhance it. And in the meantime, I'm able to stay curious um, by, by moving the business forward and also being able to challenge myself. So being able to feel like an entrepreneur day in and day out by constantly challenging myself. So um, I would say, Think about having the firm operate with less of you so that you can split your time to pursue other things um, that may or may not still be involved with your practice. Um, And if you think about that, please don't hesitate to ask FM me again. Ask me another question or just send me a note and maybe we can pick this back up. Uh, Next question. 
I am 26 and have never been in a serious relationship. I've basically been single all my life, but I don't feel motivated to meet guys in date. I feel the whole thing is boring and tedious. How can I motivate myself to start dating or should I motivate myself to start dating? First of all, congratulations. Like having ter- being 26 and never being in a serious relationship is does is like neither here nor there you know what I mean it's like maybe you've been working on other things you clearly haven't been interested in it or maybe you have been interested in it and you just don't have the guts to admit it to yourself so um I had a situation like that a couple of years ago maybe like four years ago three years ago I would go to therapy and be like you know I just don't think that relationships are for me and she would constantly say you are so ambivalent about this and I was and I don't know if I was afraid I think um looking back I feel like I can say that um perhaps I didn't think that I could have the kind of relationship that I wanted um because I felt like the kind of relationship I wanted wasn't traditional um I didn't believe that I would be able to find someone that um sort of fit into my um my sort of like core plan of like you know how I want to like how I want to live my life um with purpose with passion um which means that there's a lot of travel involved and um a lot of seeing the world and uh, whatever 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 carrying on carrying on so First thing is that ask yourself, are you fronting to yourself about what you want? You know, and if you are, you need to you need to confront that and work on that. Um, If you don't feel motivated to date or meet guys, then don't. You know, it's like, why do you you why do you want to start dating Um, if you don't want to? To me, it sounds like you're not interested in it, in it at all. It is not a life requirement like you're not required to date in life if you don't want to. And I say that when you are motivated and you are ready, then go for it. But until then, enjoy an unconditional relationship with yourself. Um, And say that again, an unconditional relationship with yourself. Treat yourself well Um, and accept yourself for all your quirks and and all of that. Um, Next thing, this is a good one. I'm 25. I'm in B school working on getting my MBA. My boyfriend is 26, has his GED, and is comfortable with his city job. He is a great boyfriend and treats me nicely, encourages me, but is nowhere near as ambitious as me with his own life. Would you date someone beneath you educationally or ambitious-wise? So uh, I said it once and I'll say it again. The answers are always in the question. So you have an issue with where he is in life and you want me to confirm what you already know to be true for you. See what I'm saying? So you already know what matters to you and what's important to you. And just don't be afraid to um, confront that. So a couple questions ago, I said that, you know, I was in a relationship with someone who wanted to be with me. I wasn't sure if I wanted to be with them because there were some things that I personally needed. And the only way to find out was to continue to date that person or whatever, be in a relationship with them. And so, um, don't be, if something matters to you, then it matters to you. But I wanted to share a story with you. Um, I have a bachelor's degree from a school with some seriously average rankings, right? Like I tried to look it up before I did this and like is average in many ways and probably below average in others. So like I did not go to um, some high end five star, you know, Ivy league situation. Um, The person that I'm currently in a relationship with has a master's degree and has taught a couple of times um, at various universities, if you will. So Um, according to you, (laughs) I am beneath him. However, um, I'm, you know, certain that I probably make anywhere from five to 10 times more his salary. Um, and his salary is not bad, but, uh, I probably do. And so it's like, so who's beneath who, you know? And it's like, um, I may not have all of the, decorations you know I may not have all the bells and whistles the the fancy degree this and that but um I don't think that that's a way that you can measure um someone in a relationship so and you just don't know 
what can happen with someone in their life uh if they are you know there there's uh, people who are content like there's just not enough to be said for people who are um who are content with with their life if that's not for you then you have to ask that question to yourself. If you want to be with someone that's ambitious and striving for more, it's okay to want that. You know, I want that, but I don't think that you should start measuring who's doing what and how because titles and degrees are just that. So um, I guess I would say be careful what you use to measure. Um, And I just always would say I want to be in a relationship with someone who's ambitious um, and my dad used to always tease me like I don't know that you're that you're going to find someone who's ambitious as you I have um and in some ways I would say (laughs) sometimes more ambitious like ambitious about things that I'm just like oh my god that's not gonna work but who am I to say what's not going to work you know or someone who um my current boyfriend um has already written one book and is writing another and I'm just like oh my god why so many books uh but that's him that's his life that's it's like you just finished a book I think he brought home something else he had just had published and it's just like it's so amazing but I'm just like wow wow so ambitious um maybe more ambitious than me but I guess my ambition just yields a bit more cash and so just be careful um with that but if you want ambition get ambition uh, last question. And I thank you guys for hanging with me and listening today. Uh, my leak, how should I go about getting the attention of someone I would like to mentor me? What tips do you have to offer? And my tip is, my tip is very simple. You need to be working so hard and making so many waves that your mentor can't help but notice you. That is how you get the attention of someone you would like to mentor you. Um, that's not necessarily by going up to them and asking them. Um, but you need to be doing some really fantastic things. And if you do reach out and ask, you need to have a fat stack of things to show, um, why you deserve this person's attention and why you, um, can prove that you will not be a waste of their time. And so that's what I think you guys should do. Thank you as always for listening. Um, we got a good long lengthy podcast today. Um, please don't hesitate to ask me more questions. You can go to my website, my or you can just ask.fm backslash my leak teal. Bye y'all.